Hello and welcome back to the stream. Apologies for having left so suddenly earlier. Unfortunately, uh, real life does sometimes interfere with important things such as streaming. Um, so previously we had been looking at this error uh, that we thought we'd fixed that uh, for some reason creates an invalid binary search. I have some idea of why this may be happening, but let's go ahead and take a, a better look. So the function we create here um, is returns the sun info um, at a, uh, and takes one of the values out of it minus the star info uh, and takes some information out of that. So the star info here is the rise um, set and uptime. So these numbers all look positive and correct. I think the problem might be the sun altitude uh, is negative. So let's go ahead and do that as well. Let's go ahead and uh, let's go ahead and look at the sun and see if all these numbers are positive, or at least they're doing what we need them to do in the sense that when we subtract the uh, sun minus the star, we get a a positive number uh, because the function f that we're looking at uh, is going to be between zero and two pi. So if, if it starts off below zero, things aren't going to go well. Okay. And sun is not defined. That's true. Sun is not defined. Um, in fact, uh -huh. that is actually very correct. So, um, so I guess we actually have to go ahead and print this. So the lat still going to be lat. The date is going to start off as zero, and the altitude is going to start off as, um, I guess, whatever we're using as the altitude here, which is um, star alt? No, sun alt. Um, okay, and then, so that's where sun info is going to start the search. It's going to end it with d equals 360. Uh, six, I think. So let's see what this does. Okay, one. Uh, beta noon rise set. That seems fine. Uh, but apparently this is where things go a little bit wonky. Um, Excuse me. Um, we're saying the sun is rising. Well, actually, it would be good to know what um, what our values here are. What our value system is here, man. Um, in so date is being logged after the fact. So I think this would be useful here to. Um, I can't use alpha because I think I'm using it somewhere else. But it would be useful here to um, to log K1, K2, and K3. Okay, let's try this. And I think we're sort of approaching the point where we think that our clue jing is getting too clue We might have to seek a different approach. So Twilight, Star Horizon, okay. Um, right. So the problem here is that the sun, um, it, we're going from negative point, this number minus this number, which is indeed a negative number, to this number minus this number, which is also a negative number, uh, because we have the set time is now earlier than the rise time, because we've done that looping by, by 2 pi. So... And the problem, of course, is um, when we look at the sun's right ascension, our assumption of right ascension, um, w we basically go from 0 to 2 pi. So we'll never see a negative uh, right ascension of the sun. Um, so that, that, that's why we're not kind of getting this, um, ever getting this correct, this number here that is the subtraction of these two. Um, 
And I think we can actually fix that by basically adding 2 pi and modding that by 2 pi as well. Um, because that should have the same effect. Um, and as I say that, well actually that would work because both of these numbers would then become positive um, and we, there would be a, uh, oh that actually wouldn't work either. Okay. So this is getting ugly. And let's take a look at what we're trying to do here. Okay, so we know when the star, um, the time that a star rises and sets is fixed. Uh, that's, that's a constant because stars, except for the sun, don't change their right ascension or declination. So we're good on that part, and now we need to find when the sun rises and, um, I guess, and we know the formula for rising and setting, uh, so we know the right ascension of when the star um, rises and sets, and we now just need to figure out when the sun uh, uh, rises and sets at the same uh, at the same s local sidereal time. Um, so the um, the problem here appears to be that let's see the sun. And I guess we're making the assumption, well, are we making the assumption that rise occurs before set? Uh, because when we come to sidereal time, that's probably not the case. Um, okay. Hmm. <sighs> So we know the uptime, that's fine. And I guess we want the uptime to go from... All right, let's see. Hmm. So the moon is RA, that's actually pretty, pretty simple there. And the rise time is RA minus uptime. Um, the problem is that could be a negative number. And we don't want that. Um, okay. So for the sun at a given latitude we can say the rise and set RA are certain numbers and we want to vary the um, we want to vary the the day of the year so we hit a zero there um, okay okay so here for our star Yeah, I don't think this is necessarily a good idea here. Um, yeah, the problem is going to be when the sun... Um, and we know what the sun's RA and, and declination are. Um, So I think we need to deal more with the case where the right ascension is bigger than 2 pi or smaller than 0. Um, and I guess one way to do that yes, I'm going to have some problems with this here. Okay this is non-trivial. It probably is trivial, I just don't know how to do it. Um, I can't think of it at the moment, but let's see here. Uh, function equals to sun info, okay. Um, so I guess... Um, Alright, so I guess we're saying beta, the sun rises at 4, sets at 1, 
That's probably ugly. Um, because that means this function here will go from 4 to 1, but it's actually going to increase past the 2 pi boundary, which is not good. Um, so let me go ahead and undo this little mess that I did here, while at the same time, of course, being very clever and not actually getting rid of any code. So I think the mod by 2pi was not, this is not correct, is it? It's this, and this, and then we can copy this, and we can restore it to what it was before without getting rid of anything in case we need it. So it's going to be noon is ra, rise is ra minus uptime, set is ra plus uptime, uptime because we actually mean, we don't mean uptime, is that. Okay, so now we should get back to the other error we had, the simpler error. Um, let's go ahead and do that. Okay. And we should be getting a, um, okay. So the sun uh, rises at negative one hours, negative 1.6 radians. Um, the star rises at negative 1.58 radians. Um, so this binary search is fine. The problem will arise when we're looking at, oh, we are looking at twilight actually. So the binary search, this is a fine binary search, nothing wrong with this binary search. Because it is going from a um, negative number to a positive number, there must be a zero between them because it is continuous. So that's, that's fine. Um, okay, here's where we get the problem. Um, twilight, sun horizon, set. Okay, well, the sun rises at this time sidereal time, in radians, sets at this time, and the star sets at 1.58. Um, so this is the su this is at z day zero, 1.69 uh, minus 1.58, or this actually. Um, so the sun starts out rising later. Um, Sorry, setting setting later than the star. And then that number just keeps increasing to 6.41, which is not what we want. Um, so I think what we want to say here is if the min and max are both... Um, yeah. If, the, if both of these numbers are bigger than zero... Uh, and, and this one's going to be 2 pi bigger than this one. I think we can just subtract off basically 2 pi there and, and be good. Um, yes, yeah, so, that's a, so th this is the, where the problem comes in, the binary search. Um, okay, so what we really need to do is make sure that the binary search has a um, has a negative number and a positive number. Um, okay, so let's see. Um, so how are we going to handle that? Because that, that could be very ugly. Um, well, okay, we, we know we're going to handle that by saying that if both numbers are positive, we subtract both by 2 pi. If they're both negative, we can add 2 pi to them. But where do we... We really don't want to put that in the binary search because that makes it way too specific. Um, um, so we don't want to do it there. But let's see, before we call the binary search... Okay. Okay. So this is the number that it returns. 
And I guess what we could do is we could set a flag to see if, um... All right. So before we begin this binary search... Oh, Jesus Christ. Um... Um, so bef even before we send this to the binary search, we could say, um... If both values are positive or negative, both values are positive, subtract 2 pi. If both values are negative, add 2 pi. This is going to get frickin' ugly. So if... Oh, man. Okay, so we're going to have to define a new function called g, which is very much like f, except uh, if, if necessary, it adds or subtracts 2 pi. This is um, just hideous, actually. Um, but okay. Um, so we're just going to define, we have to define g ahead of time, uh, because otherwise we can't, we can't assign it inside of an if statement. Um, so if f0 is greater than, and f366 is greater than 0, g is equal to the function that takes d to return f of d minus 2 times math pi. Okay. Awesome. Else if is, is it else if? No, this only Perl does out that kind of else if. If f0 is less than 0 and f366 is less than 0, there's, there's going to be an issue here. Um, There might be a corner case here where um, I guess that that's actually okay. Hmm. All right, we'll leave it like this for now. There might be a slight possible problem here if um, the value where it hits zero is bigger than three sixty-five point, you know, whatever we said the number of days in a year is, and three sixty-six. But I don't think that's going to be an issue. All right, so if if it turns out that uh, f sends both of these to negative numbers, uh, this will just return add 2 pi to that, so then we'll have something that's positive and negative, and if neither of those conditions is true, then g is just equal to f. Okay. This is kind of a hack. Well, it, it is a hack. Um, so f is now going to be just g, and I think we can do that. Um, and I had a really cool way of testing this, which we will still try to use, but it's sort of uh, become uninteresting now. Okay, um, date March 29th. I'm not seeing invalid binary search here anywhere, which is nice. Okay. Um, it looks gorgeous and actually this looks pretty correct too because um, okay that looks a little bit weird because the rise and set should be really right at the same time as the uh, as the, um, the spring equinox oh no because we have a 34 uh, minutes of arc so that that's fine um, and this actually looks good this actually looks correct okay so now we're going to go ahead and kill off many of the console logs. Uh, let's see. Uh, I don't think we need... Yeah, I think we can get rid of this. Um, I'm tempted to put a console log here instead of just returning the bad binary search. 
uh, because that really seems like it's more more of an error that needs to be expressed. But I'll I'll let it go for now. Um, don't need that. Don't need that. Don't need that. And let's see, G equals blah 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 blah. blah. Uh, we don't need that anymore. Um, my dad equals blah, 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 blah. Uh, don't need that. Okay, let's see what this does. I think I might have actually gotten rid of too much crap. Oh, no, there it is. Gorgeous. Alrighty, now, what if it's at 12 hours? Can you still handle it? Um, okay, wherever it says about to do stuff and about to do stuff, we need to get rid of... Oh, actually, that might be where we actually need it to be. These numbers all look okay. Um, let's see what this does. Uh, all of these numbers are at least not giving error messages. So now, we have to do two important things. One is, since it's working, we're going to download it. And we're going to push it to get with the phrase Oscar. I don't even know what that means. Is it the Grouch? Is it the Emmy Award? Is it the guy from the office? Whatever it is, we've pushed it to get. Okay. So now the thing I was actually excited about earlier. Uh, which was, we're going, we can do some sort of cool random testing here. And I guess what we want to do here, though, is, um, yeah, I think for right now I'm okay with just doing the console, console logging here. Um, uh, let's see. And it actually occurs to me, get document element by, the, oh man, okay. Now, JavaScript does not have seeded random... It does have random numbers, but not seeded random numbers. Um, so what we're trying to do here is... And I think we can do that here in index, actually. Uh, we don't need this anymore. So we're going to have document get element by ID. All right, why is this not doing magic? Document, okay. Well, I guess that is it's going to be this, but I guess it doesn't. Oh, there we go. A little bit, a little bit of highlighting for us. Value equals. I don't think this is going to work. I think you need to use set value. I don't think you can just set the value like this. But let's run it and find out. Document get element by ID is not. Of course, it's not a function. Why would it be? Um, alrighty. Oh, actually, hang on. Well, wait a minute. All right, I'm gonna copy this. Oh. Off by one fucking character. Now, if someone were smart, they would write a document get element by capital ID function and just set it equal to get element by ID lowercase. But JavaScript still sucks. Um, yep, and in this case, I made a stupid mistake because, of course, I need can't refer to things uh, before I define them. Right now. <gasps> that actually worked. I'm so shocked. Okay. So now. Let's see what that does. I think that's just going to make it a random number between. Um, yeah. Between 0 and 1. Does this make it a random number between 0 and 24? It does not. 
Um, so when in doubt, look at the instructions. Um, I don't know how, how, how versatile math random is. Um, oh. Yeah. The implementation selects the initial seed cannot be chosen or reset by the user because JavaScript sucks. Uh, does not provide cryptographically secure random numbers. Apparently there is no option you can give to random. You just zero to, to one and you have to, just like with primitive programming languages, you have to multiply it by whatever you want. Not a huge deal, but still stupid. All right, so for this we want, you know, math random. Uh, and then we're going to set the... Um, and we will run into problems here, I think. Uh, I think. Um, so the value of uh, d uh, declination is going to be 180 times this minus 90. And of latitude actually is going to be the same thing. Not the same value, but the same formula. A random number between 0 and 180 minus 90 gives us a random number between 90 and negative 90. So now we can test, we can do this, we can get console values, everything is going beautifully. Um, run again, new random values, everything is still going beautifully. Uh, we, we will expect this to crash and burn in a minute here. This is not going to crash and burn though. Um, So this is a little bit problematic because I was hoping to show a mistake. Uh, here's where we're going to have a mistake. Okay. Undefined. The, the problem we should have here is... Um, oh good, I can keep these numbers as long as I want. That's nice. Um... is that a store at, at declination negative 83 degrees is never going to rise at this latitude. Um, which means over here where we're computing the uh, star info, this arc, the number inside the arc cosine here is going to be undefined. So, and that that's a that's a problem. We, we don't want that to happen. Um, and so what I should be seeing here is that uptime is undefined. Because you can't take the arc cosine of a number whose absolute value is bigger than 1. Um, can I? I can trash this, right? Yeah, okay. So I'm going to run this and now look at the output. Um, okay, that's not cool. Um, so is the issue that it can't actually get to that line? And, but it should just crash there. And I should have a semicolon there. Um, uptime A and uptime B. And actually, I can't print up time because I haven't computed it yet. But let's do this. Oh, shit. Luckily, I chose a Declan. This happens to be another case where this will fail. But I do need to remember not to. Uptime D is not a number um, for, for this one case. That is correct. So what we need to do here is... Um, There's a couple of ways we can do this. Uh, one is we just use the standard formula to um, to see when a star is circumpolar, always up, or uh, you know the opposite of circumpolar, which doesn't have a word for it, meaning it's never up. Uh, but maybe another way to do this is a thing we take our cosine of and. Let's see, because yeah, I'm pretty sure 
let me see what's happening when we do this one again. Um, cause I'm pretty sure what's happening here is we're not actually, well, we are getting to uptime B. Um, so I guess it's returning um, the right ascension and then a bunch of knotted numbers. Uh, maybe maybe we should hang on. Maybe we should look at that here. Uh, let's see. Uh, da -da -da -da. We should be saying okay, this is fine. Um, and I think I was smart enough to reserve where I logged my um, star info. So let's see what kind of star info we're getting back here. So do this, do this, do this, do that. Um, I need to find out what gamma is. Okay. Maybe printing uptime A and uptime B all this many times is not a great idea. Let's undo that. Because I think we need to have our solution... Okay, kind of bugs me now that it's not... Oh, do you know what? It might. I might have to actually re rerun it to get the new stuff. Yeah, I, I do. Okay, so to rerun this, uh, declination is 70. Um, I think this maybe this won't happen in this condition. Uh, aha, here it is. Rise, not a number. Set, not a number. Uh, uptime, not a number. Okay, good. Because... A latitude 55, a star that's at le de declination 73, will never set. All right, so I think we can, we can, um, we can adjust for that case long before we need to do anything else. So here, okay, gotta be a little bit careful here, but it's not that difficult. Um, Oh, and do we decide the RA is going to be given to us? No, it's going to be given to us in radians. Um, do we? Yeah, we do. We multiply it by the appropriate amount. Um, check for circumpolarity or opposite. Um, and I guess we'll just return some sort of special flag if we know that it is uh, it's circumpolar or, um, or whatever. Okay, so at a latitude of let's say 40 degrees, um, the the uh, north celestial pole is at 40 degrees uh, high in the north sky. So anything north of 90 minus 40 is going to be circumpolar. In other words, if the declination is greater than math pi over two minus the latitude, um, we're circumpolar because uh, the declination is too high. Um, and so normally, I guess we return um, okay, so normally we return res and a bunch of of dates for everything, um which we could do here, but we're not going to um, Here we're just going to return an error. It's not really an error, but it's a special condition. Um, and we can actually make this one line because I'm a total dickwad. Um, this is really quite simple, so I want to do it like that. Um, and the other possibility is, let's see, at latitude 40, uh, I'm just using 40 as my sort of base point. I, I, it's not it obviously this should work for any latitude. Um, latitude 40. If the declination is less than, uh, let's see, it's 50 degrees to the horizon, which, uh, sorry, to the to the, excuse me, to the zenith. So the zenith point is going to be um, uh, 90 minus. 40 minus 40, um, 40 degrees, 
Is that really true? I guess so. I guess the line of declination that passes overhead uh, is the line is the same as the line of your latitude, because the pole star is going to be up at lat, and therefore um, the zenith is 90 minus lat away. Um, so it's going to be lat minus. So 90. Oh, actually, I could be wrong. Hang on. So if the pole star is at 40 degrees, um, and that's 90 degrees declination, then if you go at 50 degrees, yep, it is. It is your declination. Um, okay. So this is, um, if your declination is, so if the overhead point is your latitude, then I think the plus, it, okay, now it's going to just do this. The plus and minus rule applies here. Um, so I think we could actually write this as, let's see. So your latitude, let's see here. So your latitude is the thing that goes overhead your zenith. You cannot get more than 90 degrees above it or below it. So if your declination is greater than um, all right, still thinking. The declination at your at your horizon um, is going to be plus ninety minus minus. Okay, maybe maybe we can't do it that way. All right. So at forty degrees, we know that the if your declination is bigger than fifty degrees your circumpolar, and if you're, um, I guess it's going to be minus 50. Um, if your declination is less than minus 50, what does that make it? Um, minus 50, so that's going to be your latitude minus pi over 2. And I'm pretty sure that we could write this as, I could almost write this as if the absolute value of your declination minus your latitude uh, exceeds a certain number, um, then, you're, then you're screwed. And I think we could just say, ooh, um, declination minus latitude, the absolute value of that uh, cannot be greater than pi over 2. But actually, we, we want to keep these two cases separate anyway, so that's OK. If the declination is less than uh, lat minus pi over 2. And let me make sure that's correct. Okay. So at 10 degrees, um, minus 90 would be minus 80, which is fine. And 90 minus 10 is 80, which is fine. Let's just try a negative number to be sure. So let's say negative 20 latitude. Um, at negative 20 latitude, 90 minus minus 120 doesn't make any sense. So there's, there's something wrong here. Um, so at negative 20 degrees, the stars that are circumpolar are the ones that are below negative 70. Um, so I think I mean if the absolute declination is greater than math pi over 20, which would be 70. Um, um, no, no, the distance from the pole, all right, so your latitude is a distance from the pole, and that's just going to be um, either negative math, either 90 degrees minus your latitude or negative 90 degrees minus your latitude, depending on um, which hemisphere you're in. But either way, it's going to be absolute value of 
90 minus your latitude. Um, right, so let's see. Um, so if you're 40 degrees, it's going to be anything above 50 is circumpolar. If you're at negative 40 degrees, anything below negative 50 is circumpolar. Uh, so let's let's write these conditions out. Okay. Um, northern hemisphere. Um, deck graded. So we've, we've got it for the northern hemisphere. Um, southern hemisphere. Uh, if your declination is less than, because we are now looking at lower declinations are more circumpolar, because the, the south pole is always going to be circumpolar. And so in this case, it's going to be, um, I think it's going to be this, but let's quickly check. Uh, so as you've had negative 20, uh, no. Okay. So it's going to be, I think, negative math pi, negative left. So that's going to be negative 90 minus minus 20 is negative 70, and this seems correct. If your declination is below uh, negative 70, you are circumpolar. Okay. So the question is, can we build this into one nice little inequality here? Um, and the answer is no. Uh, let's see. Minus, so math, pi 90 minus 40 is 50. Minus 90, I think that should be it. Uh, hang on. So at minus 40 uh, degrees latitude, this is negative 90 minus minus 40, which is plus 40, which is negative 50, which is correct. So these formulas are correct. Can we combine them? into a um, into a single formula and the answer might be no um, I'm so convinced that we could we could combine these into a single formula because... Ugh. So the question is, can we show that the declination plus, okay, all right, hang on. So we have here dec plus lat is greater than math pi over two, and dec plus lat is less than math. Okay, that's not what I wanted. I was hoping we'd use absolute values here, but um, let's see. If the absolute value of the deck plus the lat, I mean, the uptime formula sort of gives it away. The uptime formula here is blah, 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 minus tan deck tan lat. Actually, that doesn't give it away. Never mind. Um... All right, so is there a way to combine this stuff, saying that either... So, I mean, one way to say this is the absolute value of the deck plus the lat, or actually the deck plus lat, its absolute value, um, if its absolute value is greater than math pi over 2, then it's circumpolar. Um, I think that's correct. Um, all right, let's see if that is the correct thing to be looking at here. Okay, so if your latitude is, let's say, 40 degrees, what can make, um, I guess it's greater than, that's the bad that's the bad condition. Okay, so if you're uh, uh, 40 degrees, um, 
40 plus lat is greater than... Wow, I feel like I'm doing algebra again. All right, let's do it. So absolute value. So if you're 40 degrees, it says 40 plus lat is greater than 90, uh, which means 40 plus lat is either greater than 90 or um, 40 plus lat is less than negative 90. Because if, you're greater, if your absolute value is greater than 90, you're either above 90 or below negative 90, which says lat is greater than 50. Or, and I think this should be an impossible condition, which is why it's okay. Lat is less than minus 130. So th this is fine. So this is this is the correct condition here. Um, because it either the southern or the north. Well, let's go ahead and do the northern half. Uh, let's do the southern hemisphere now. And I think in both cases, one of these will s will not make sense. So here in the southern hemisphere, this says lat is greater than 130, which doesn't make sense, or lat is less than negative 50. That's not what I meant. That is actually I meant to say deck plus. So the declination, if the declination is 40, is okay. So the the latitude is 40. And then. This says the declination is greater than 150, which is circumpolar declination less than one minus 30 never happens. Here we're saying that if the decl declination plus 40 is greater than 90, sorry, the latitude here is negative 40, or the declination plus the latitude, which is negative 40, is less than ni negative 90, we have circumpolarity. This becomes the impossible condition that the deck is greater than 130, whereas this becomes the correct condition that if the deck is less than negative 50, we are circumpolar. Okay. So I'm convinced that is correct. All right, so the other condition is when is it um, that you can't see it at all? Um, and I think that's going to be Let's see. In the north, if your declination is less than, uh, so if you're at 40 degrees, you have to be less than negative 50. If you're at 80 degrees, it's negative 10. If you're at zero degrees, you can see all the way to the south. So the declination, I think, has to be less than latitude minus pi over 2, is what I'm thinking. Uh, so let's see. 90 degrees, yeah, you can't see anything below the equator. 40 degrees, ne negative 50 at 10, you can go all the way down to minus 80. So it is, it is latitude minus 90 degrees. Um, the southern hemisphere, uh, it's going to be the declaration, declination, uh, is going to be, has to be too big. We can see all the, the, the declinations all the way down to negative 90, so the, con the, the consideration here is uh, that the, um, the declination is too too large for us to see. And that would be, let's say, so if you're at negative 20 latitude, it would be that plus pi over 2. Okay? And then the question is, how do we um, combine these? And I think it is going to be dec minus lat is... greater than pi over 2. Um, so really quick testing here at, uh, let's say, at 80 degrees latitude, this says dec minus 80 is greater than 90, which makes no sense, or dec minus 80 is less than negative 90. This is for latitude of negative 80, no, of positive 80 and which says dec is less than negative 10, which is correct. And now, if the declination is negative 80 degrees, this says dec or dec plus 80 less than negative 90. This becomes dec greater than 10, which is correct. 
That's not right. Whew. All right. Do I mean less than here? Maybe. Let me check real quick. Okay, so if you're at latitude 8 degrees, this would say deck minus 80 is uh, greater than 90, which says deck is greater than 170, which is meaningless. Or deck minus 80 is less than 90, which is like saying deck minus 80, oh sorry, deck is less than negative 10. And if the declination is less than negative 10, you cannot be risen. If you're at negative 80, this says deck plus 80 greater than 90. Oh, this is actually correct. If your declination is greater than 10 degrees, and you're at negative 80, you're invisible. Okay. Um, Anti-circumpolar. Okay. So now, if absolute value of deck plus lat exceeds math pi over 2, return circumpolar. Circumpolar. That's, I don't know how to pronounce that word. Um, return this, the object that's that. And now since we've returned, we don't have to do an else or anything here. Um, wait. Deck plus lat, deck minus lat. And for some reason this seems like it's really, really familiar. And if that's greater than math pi over 2, Return error anti circumpolar. Uh, that's just for my own bent. That's just for my own amusement. And the rest of these cases we can handle uh, naturally. Uh, like that. All right. So let's see if um, let's see if that is. Unfortunately, I'm going to have to redo this, which means, in this case, it should work out. Everything should work out nicely. Um, we don't need that anymore. And in this case, it looks like these results are all correct. Um, this should still be visible, actually. Okay, and I realize I could just change these values until they, here we go, at a declination of minus 71, at 50 you will not be able to see it. Correct. And now, if we put it at a declination of plus 71, it should never set. Yeah. Okay, let's mess with this. If your declination of 71, um... I think at 71 you will still set, but just barely. Uh, no. Okay, so if your declination of 71, um, you're 29 degrees from the, uh, from the North Pole. Um, hmm. That's actually... So you're definitely circ oh well okay hang on hang on so you're circumpolar all the way down to I think twenty twenty degrees is that right no so is it seventy that you're not circumpolar anymore no okay Polaris is circumpolar oh yeah yeah this will be actually like twenty degrees you will be barely circumpolar I think. Yeah, but if you go down like below, like 19, because 71 plus, this is a, a border case actually, circumpolar. All right, 18 degrees, you should definitely not be circumpolar, although you won't set for very long. Yeah. Wait. Something looks wrong with this. Am I forgetting about... Um, yep, I think I'm forgetting about uh, the 34 
and 60, the, the refraction coefficient, which actually says you, you get to be non-circumpolar. You can be circumpolar even if you're like within half a degree of, of this, which, 19, which we're not actually. So that's kind of surprising. Um, okay. So we still have sort of a bad corner case here. So it's 17 degrees latitude. Sorry, let me try that again. 17 degrees latitude. These numbers are staggered enough that I believe them. At 18 degrees latitude, these numbers are not believable. Um, and I'm pretty sure what's going to happen here is because the thing you're taking the arc cosine of is bigger, has absolute value bigger than one. And that's, that's, that should not happen because our test is supposed to check for that. So let's see here. Sign up, minus Alrighty. Thing we are taking a cos of. Um, nope. Well, that actually is okay, but I don't. I don't want to redefine that. So cos mod equals. Let's just suck it out of here. And am I in too many deep? And then arc cosine of. And the nice thing here is we can um, we can check to see if cosine the, the thing that we're taking the arc cosine of is is meaningful has a value between um, negative one and one and I suspect that's where we're running into problems. Okay, so I do need to reload this. Let me just. Um, this will actually work pretty nicely. Whoa! Kosval is not defined. No, it's not. There we go. And unfortunately, I think if I run this again, it's not going to work properly because I have to hit this run button again. Uh, let's see what this does. That's interesting. Um, circumpolar. Yeah, at 84 degrees, everything above 6 degrees is going to be circumpolar. So let's bump this down a bit. Um, uh, 52 degrees at f so at 40 degrees I think it's going to be non-circumpolar I am wrong um, sorry it's going to be 30 whatever makes this number just below the sum of these numbers just below 90 um, nope which asked me 37 is what I meant of course Okay. So none of this is really that bad. Okay. So this is the good case. The bad case is going to occur when I get even closer to um, to 90 degrees. Um... There it is. This is the problem. In the very first cosine value, which throws everything else off, you can't take the arc cosine of negative of a number bigger than negative one. So somehow it's getting back. It's ignoring that, or it's doing something, but then it's going. It's it screws up the whole calculation somehow. Um, and the reason this is happening is because. We need to add this number, these two numbers add up to less than 90 degrees, but they do add up to more than uh, 89 and 26 60th degrees. In other words, once we allow for refraction, uh, we screwed this up. So I think we can fix that here in our little absolute value test. Um, Uh, let's see. 
Come on, script. Ooh, this thing's misbehaving. All right, there we go. And here we have the test. Um, there we are. Uh, okay, so if deck plus lat is greater than not not quite 90 um, because you have that 34 degree okay Jesus fucking Christ this is what I get for accuracy so 34 over 60 that's in degrees over 180 times math pi um, and I think this is going to be the same thing here and the amount of hard coding I'm doing is just hideously ugly. Okay. So now in theory, this number in 37.5, I'm going to have to rerun this, but... Um, wait. Did I? Okay. Somehow I got those numbers back. I didn't really know how that works. Okay, circumpolar, good, uh, because this number is close enough that it never gets below negative 34 degrees. So now if I do this, still should be circumpolar. Yep. This, we should get some correct values. Nope. Um, all right, we're looking at half a degree here, so 37 point, this still shouldn't work, but 0 0.1 might. Damn it. Point zero? If this doesn't work, then we have a different problem. Yeah. And these numbers should be nowhere near March 20th. There we go. Okay. So this is a very tight condition here. Uh, so now if you're at negative 37 and 52, this might be never rises. Actually, let's do this, 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 this. Okay, we're fine. Um, and I guess what we're going to do here is just... Um, we're not going to print the cosine value because that's a little bit ugly, but we will warn them if... Um, you're trying to take the arc cosine of a number whose absolute value is bigger than one. And we're going to do that as a hard print, a console log rather. Uh, we're not going to do it as just a return value. Okay. And let's see, so if math apps cos value, cos, cos val, greater than one, console log error. Um, might as well interpolate if we can. Cosval absolute value of Cosval greater than one. And really I should do some sort of die here, but I'm not quite that brave. And the other place I'd like to do that is invalid. There we are. I guess, what do we want to return in the case that we have a uh, bad... Uh, do we just want to keep going here? I mean, we really can't return anything. Um, we might as well just return... Um, I mean, that's just, that's just something to return that's going to mess them up. Because that should never happen. Console log. Invalid binary Actually, I think we can do this. And that gives us a little bit more information about what the bad binary search is about. Run it. Run it. OK. 
Okay. Good. Oh, I'm sorry, we need to do this. And this, and this looks like we might have a uh, anti circum polo. Good. Um, this. There should be some normal results here. Okay. So, now that we're pretty happy, we're going to run some tests here in just a second. Um, but now that we're pretty happy with this, well, let's go ahead and actually start to give answers in HTML instead of just console logging them. But first, download a zip, save to git, say unbroken, although, yeah, I guess that is correct. I mean, we broke it and then we unbroke it. That's the way we do it. That's the way we do it. That, I screwed that song up. All right, so now we probably don't need to say about to do stuff anymore. So here's what we do. We do all this. Um, let res equal. This sucker. Okay. And now... Um, we're going to basically build up a little string here. Uh, if res error, what do we say it was going to be like circumpolar and anti-circumpolar? Now I regret having silly names here. Yep, circumpolar and anti-circumpolar. I don't know why you need to use triple equals for strings, but I will do it. Um, We're going to build up a string to print out into div, and then we'll print it to div. Uh, str equals star is always star never sets. Okay. Oh. Okay, hang on. Yeah, I think we're fine here. Else if res error equal equal equal. Uh, anti circumpolar stir equals star never rises. Okay, but now the big condition, of course, is when neither of these is true. Um, stir equals alrighty. Let's take a look at what this gives us. Um, I'm going to go ahead and quote this so we can just have it in the main body of the program just so I know what I'm what what needs to happen. So this is just temporary here and it's going to be just what we need. Okay. So the store is going to be equal to now something fairly interesting. Uh let's see. Now these time let's see so so Okay, even though these times are going to be reversed for the star, I think this is the proper order to do it in. Star rises at dawn, uh, and that's going to be, oh yeah, this is going to be one hell of a string. Um, star rises at dawn will be stir of twilight star horizon rise, yep. Now, I wonder if we can do, like, multiple lines here and, and the template won't get annoyed with us. So if we can do, like, this instead of having to sort of... No, I don't want that. Okay, this. Um, and then... Already not looking good, but anyway. Break. Blue lines don't hurt anything. Star rises with sun. That is Sun Horizon, Star Horizon Rise. And then Sun Sets with Star. Stir. And that's going to be the Sucker. 
And then sun sets. Nope, it's the s star sets rises with sets with sun. Yeah, and I think we can probably be capitalizing the word sun. Star sets at dusk. Okay, and this will be twilight star horizon set. And then I think that is it. I have no idea if that's going to actually work. But now we can actually say, and that's our else statement. And then we could say, we'll console log it. But then, eventually, of course, what we're going to do is we're going to put it into the div tag we created. But let's see if this even works. Let's see if it allows this. Damn it. Um, unexpected token colon. Um, so we are ending this here. Break, end, break, end, break, end. So let's follow the standard procedure of chopping stuff off until it works. Okay, so that's something more than that. Mm. So let's see if they even allow this. Okay. So I think maybe my problem is somewhere else. Um, oh yeah, because I had all this pasted in here for no good reason, except so I can look at it. Now let's see if this works. Yep, 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 yep. Okay. So now let's see if the problem is here. No. Okay, circumpolar star never sets, else if anti-circumpolar star never rises, else do this. Oh, you know what? I think, I think I have one too many of these. There. Is it that? Okay. Go! Okay, that wasn't that exciting. Um, and that is true if you're that far south. This one should give us a real number. I don't know why I put stir here, because uh, the thing I was looking at is res, but you know. If you can't be a moron, where is my dawn line, though? Ooh. I accidentally got rid of that. Star rises at dawn. Res. Um, it's going to be this with the word rise instead. Syntax errors, run. As a donji tries its own, rises with. Interesting. Interesting. All right, so the final step is instead of console log, we say. Uh, whatever the hell is we got earlier. Output. Dot inner HTML equals stir. And if this works, we are in business. All right, I'll give you that. 
Yep. Okay, here we go. Alrighty, so again, we probably want to save this. Alrighty, so now let's go ahead and test this. Um... This is actually close to the latitude of, uh, well, calls bad actually. Um, alrighty, we will test with Stellarium. It's fun testing with Stellarium, but it's also not necessarily super efficient, which is why I'm a little bit hesitant. Okay, guys, I'm going to take a two-minute Pomodoro break. Whoa. A two-minute Pomodoro, Pomodoro break, and I will be right back. Okay, and we're back. Stand by. Okay, good. No one's actually showed up or anything. Okay, so let's go ahead and uh, do a um, equatorial grid, stop the time. Now, we probably won't find um, a star exactly at these coordinates. Uh, dude, that's supposed to be... There we go. Uh, but we, we're going to look for one that's sort of close and, and use that. Uh, I mean, in theory, we could try using, I mean, we could find one very, very close, but, you know. 
Okay, so there's Stellarium. I think there's a web version of Stellarium, which means I could do even more in the browser. So 22.07 minus 45.38. Okay, here's, okay, There's one bad thing about this is that it's kind of hard to see these. 20 hours, 21 hours, um, twenty-two point zero seven minus 45.38, 22, 45, 3.8, 45, 3.8, Ooh, Al Nair. That's interesting. Um, twenty-two minus. That's actually pretty close to what we want, and it's fairly bright. Uh, it is in the constellation Grusus. Grusus. Grot. No, not Grut. Grusus. And. The latitude is 33 degrees, which is actually pretty close to where we are now, but we will go ahead and uh, do this. Okay. Um, so according to this, we will have the... Uh, we'll start at April 14th and see if the star rises at dawn on April 14th. Or at least something resembling that. Okay. Um, actually, I think we should probably keep the time thingy up. No, I did not want that. Just wanted to move the stupid window. Okay. Um. So, do we have atmospheric effects on? Okay. Do we have the ground on? Ground. Okay. So now we're going to watch it rise. Presumably. Okay, at this point, I guess we do need to go back to this sort of, uh... Okay, it's rising. Its altitude is minus... So, yeah, there we go. It is... Risen. It is risen, and it does look like dawn is breaking. It is about 12.35 UTC, which here would be six hours ahead. 6.35 in the morning. So, yeah, it does look like it is now rising at dawn. Uh, I guess we to confirm that we have to look to see where the sun is. Uh, the sun is at an altitude of negative six, we would hope. Ooh. Oh, hang on. That's apparent. That's actually closer to sunrise. What's the geometric altitude? Oh, okay, hang on. The sun rises at 12 hours 37 minutes. Transits at that time. Huh. Okay. Okay, that's a little bit off from where we wanted it to be. Um, so, six, April 6th, that should be rising with the sun. Okay. So let's go back to our... Wait, what the hell is doing that star? Awkward! Alnake or something? Alnair. Okay, so now it should be rising a little bit later. And let's see, its altitude is... Uh, negative three, so okay, this side is rising a little bit later. And we can go over here. And... Still not risen, still not risen. Risen. And where's the sun now? Okay, that's... Not great, actually. 
I'm not crazy about that. Um, hmm. Okay, let's let's Mm. Okay. All right, so at um, Greenwich, this thing will transit at one hour. Well, I guess it's already telling us the sidereal time of its rising is 1247. Mm -hmm. And now let's go back to our friend, whose name we'll never remember, Al Nader. And that rises when? 13.06, so a little bit later than expected. Um, we are, of course, not adjusting for the equation of time either, um, which might, which could have actually quite a, quite a devastating effect here. Um, so I think we can call that good. I'm not really sure, though. So just as a vague check, let's go to January 22nd and see um, if it's setting with the sun, roughly. Okay. And its altitude is negative 43, so we need to go back quite a bit. Nope, we need to go forward quite a bit, because it needs to rise and then set again. <coughs> Um, and again, it does look like it's sort of setting with, um, 3, 2, 1, 0, okay. So now it's set with the sun, it's set with the, um, okay, so it's now set at 18 hour, okay, so that's pretty correct, and then we find the sun again. Ooh. But the sun sets 11 minutes later. So not 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 a great um Yeah, not not necessarily great here. Um So roughly accurate, we could probably get away with this. Um, but honestly, I think that because the equation of time is so important, we may need to bring it into the picture. Um, so preliminarily, I'm, I'm pretty happy with this. It, it does do exactly what we want it to do under assumptions that are maybe a little bit too simplified. So that, I mean, but, but we did make those assumptions. We did say early on, uh, we are going to um, we are going to assume that um, we're going to ignore the equation of time. So now what's vaguely interesting here is now if we go to 54 degrees, I think the star might become yeah never rises. At 50 degrees, oh actually at 45 degrees, the star will never rise either. Uh, we go to 44 degrees. Um, the star actually barely rises, I think, is the issue. Um, I guess one other time we could have is mm, when the star culminates at the same time as the sun, and that should be between these two times, um, between the rises and set times, which will be um, like March-ish, maybe? Um, Okay. All right, so I think we are going to say this is not good enough for production. 
uh, because the errors are big enough that if people wanted to check it against Stellarium, they would be disappointed. And as much as I enjoy disappointing people, it's not necessarily in this exact way. Okay. All right, let's see if there's anything else we want to do. I, I kind of don't want to work on this anymore because I think the next step is going to be uh, particularly ugly. We actually do have a way of interpolating the sun's position, um, you know, very, very accurately, and we've looked at that previously, and we could certainly use that more accurate interpolation uh, here, but then our result would become very ear-specific, Y-E-A-R-specific, um, which maybe is okay, uh, which maybe actually is, is fine. Uh, and also we'd have to deal with the, the concept of we don't exactly know where the spring equinox is, um, although we might be able to work around that as well. We might, we might be able to find a way to, um, to give an any binary search, reduce it to a negative to positive number, which, which will work. So we'd have to subtract off multiples of 2 pi because the interpolation that I use um, is correct, but it, it keeps adding 2 pi every year. So, so we have to subtract off those 2 pi's or something of that nature. Um, let's see what else is, if there's anything else we want to do, anything else I want to do. Um, refraction stuff has been fixed, circumpolar case. Uh, and when we answer this, we are going to use the formula of uptime and say, you know, it's RA minus this, blah, 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 blah. Um, but the thing I like, dislike the most about this is there's no closed form formula so we say at some point we actually have to do a binary search to find where this function is equal to zero. And that is sort of always ugly. Uh, then we did want to add maybe some uh, star list or a text completion interface. And the text completion interface to me is pretty exciting. Um, I, I, I've seen other people do it. I've read how to do it. Um, but I don't, I mean, I've never done it myself. And apparently it just requires listening to when someone's, t you know, typing into an input box and then somehow giving them a list of choices. So let's briefly look at that by creating a new REPL because even though we're going to end up using it in this, um, in this heliacal rising thing, um, it's, it's a really a totally different thing. It's really a totally different project. So we're going to do this, Twitch, autocomplete. So let's go ahead and do that. And let's go ahead and push it to git for no good reason. Okay. There it is. Uh, I'm not going to download nothingness here, but okay. So let's go ahead and put in a input type equals text. No, we're, we're in HTML, so we'll use real quotes. Um, ID equals text. We're very... And we'll go ahead and close off that tag. Okay. Obviously, nothing's happening yet. Let's go ahead and add a listener over here. Um, I've already forgotten how we add listeners. Um, I think it's just add listener, but let's let's. Ooh, shiny! I have a me message. Okay. Um. Let's see. Let me go ahead and use my own REPL and just look at the, the literally the last thing we did. Because uh, I have the brains of a freaking crouton. And because I know right here in Heliacal we did we did do a listener. And I'm, I'm it's something like fun, get element by ID, blah, blah, blah. And then add listener or something. Oh, okay. Oh. On click. So those are the things that you can, okay. Well, that's not going to be very exciting. Um, okay. So let text, we're going to be really bold with our variable names here. Let text equals document get element. Um, text. And then what I really want to be able to do here is say text on 
something. Um, oh, auto board on activate. This is good stuff. On blur, on change. Yeah. Um, and just call the function f, I guess. How we do it, right? New on change equals f. That was very strange. Um, okay, and then function f takes an event, and right now it's going to do nothing more than just console log the event. Okay, so if I've done this correctly, every time I type in here, we'll get nothing. Um, oh, we did get something. And I think it's not on change, because this is not a change. But when I get out of it, there, that's a change. That's not what I'm looking for, of course. We want sort of like on touch. Um, and that is on activate, on blur, on click, on copy, on type, on key press. Yes. All right, rock and roll. So now if I go over here, type, type, type. I generated four events. That's awesome. So now, um, I can certainly get the value that is in the in the console. And can I create a select menu? I mean, this is ghetto. There's a correct way of doing this that doesn't involve creating a separate select menu. Um, so, yeah, let's see if we can do that. So this is not the right way to do it. This is just... If I wanted to do it, the, what I knew, uh, select ID equals select. And I think I need to do this. Um, and I think what I can do is do an add option uh, to it from from JavaScript. I think I can add the options to it from JavaScript. Let's see if I can do that. Um, let's select document get element by ID. Select. Then what can we do with select? Um, see that append child. Okay. I don't think I can do an add option or anything, or maybe I can actually. You know, if there's an options for this, because it is a select, so it should have the concept of options. Element OP, let's see, oh, Jesus Christ. On anything. Nope, still under ON, we're looking for OP options. Um, okay. So I probably cannot, I think in order to add an option, I have to add a child to it. And the child has to be an, an option. Um, unless I can go even more ghetto. And do something like this. And honestly, I don't think that's going to work. Okay. Interesting. Um, let's 
see if I can make more of those. I, I think this is just not working as opposed to being weird. Because I don't think you can do this sort of magic with, with JavaScript. But let's see. Oh, oh, it's unhappy. L contains a literal unescaped line break. Okay, we'll just turn this into a little single quote string, Mr. Smartass. That's not the problem. Nope, didn't like that either. God damn it. Fine. This is just going to make things ugly, but it's not going to work anyway, so, you know. Yeah. Alright, so I pretty much, I'm pretty sure I have to do, like, a, uh, um... That's interesting, though. What What is the, um... Is it select dot option? No, it's not options. We learned that. It's not... Um... Okay, well, you know what? We're gonna we're gonna reverse engineer this. We're gonna put in some options and then see how we get to them um, using HTML uh, using JavaScript, and then we'll just use that method to um, to create our own options. Foo or okay. So now back over here, we want let's console log select what we can know about it. This probably won't be very useful. Yeah, and I didn't I did ex did expect that to happen. Um so because select is an object, we should be able to do something like this. Um the key goes to select of I. I do not know how well this will work. But hopefully better than what we had. Alright, here we go. Alrighty. So what select has key zero. Okay, so these are just item, named item, and blah, blah 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 blah. Somewhere here we have foo and bar as our uh, as the code that we, we kind of are looking for. Um, let's take the word foo or bar up here anywhere in here. Aha! Okay. Key, selected index zero. Oh, but that actually might just be because that's the first value. Let's see if bar appears. Ooh. Uh, inner HTML. Okay, so that's interesting. Um... But apparently we can't change the inner HTML um, and and have it up become automatically uh, change the options or whatever. Uh, text content. Gee, my name is Barry, so that kind of keeps showing up. Inner text. Inner HTML. Um, so it's apparently deeper than this. It's apparently deeper than just changing these inner text and inner uh, value. I think it's. I think we need to get children here or something. Um, Cause I'm pretty sure these guys are the options are considered children. Well, they are children elements. Um, okay, so let's see if we can look at the children of the night. No, not of the night. The children of children. Um, now is this children... Is this a method or a fucking function? Let's find out. Ooh. Object. Okay, good. So children is an array. That's good. Let's look at child number zero. <coughs> Okay. That's a nice looking child there. I love fucking children. Okay. So this appear what what the hell is this actually? Hidden? No. Um 
So I guess the question, what the frick is... This is an option, I guess. Um, maybe I should have asked type of or something. Well, I mean, it's an HTML thing, but still. Mmm, something's wrong here. Okay. Um... So now... For I in option... And let's make it the non... Let's actually make it one that's not the last or the first. Um... Okay. So it doesn't have any special properties in terms of, you know, being the last or the first. It's just an option. Let's run this sucker. Alright, so let's see what the hell you are. Um, outer H so you know what your outer HTML is, which is not a huge deal. Uh, label undefined value foo. What? Value text goes... No, that's not right. You're the second one. You're supposed to be um, SNC. Oh, no, I'm looking at the zeroth, aren't I? I need to look at the first one. Ooh, but I am. Uh, not cool. Uh, let me do this. Am I not selecting the second element correctly? Okay. I think I maybe am printing out more than I need. I'm printing out something I shouldn't be printing out. Um, oh yeah, here's why. This should be option I now. So the key is I and the value is option of I. Runorama. So now you should just be the option. Ah, uh, here we are, yes. Okay. And now you will become the second child. So... So I need to create one of you, I guess. Um... I need to run you again, don't I? Okay. So this is a... Okay, value index one, blah, blah, blah. Okay, I think maybe I'll need to figure out how to create a new option. That may be a little bit too hard to reverse engineer. So let's go back over here. And then let's see. What the hell is this? Oh, yeah. JavaScript option object. Well, at least it's pretty cool. Okay. Text value default selected selected. Um, okay. So this does not look like a very difficult thing to do. Let's boogie with it. Uh, let opt 5. We'll just call it opt 5. New option. Hello. Hello. And I do, do I need the other two? Uh, can I get away with not putting those in? I'm going to try it. If it needs it, we'll just put in, like, false, false or something. Okay. Um... Select children push. Or do I need to do array push, select children, opt five. And then the rest of this I probably don't care about. Alright. HTML collection doesn't have index property setter for three. Uh, okay. So HTML collection is not the same thing as an array. Uh, okay. So what is type of... 
select children. I guess it's an HTML collection, not an array. That's probably... That's really not helpful. Um, oh, sorry, what is children 2? I guess that's going to be a... Uh, yeah. Not helpful! Okay, so what can we do with an HTML collection? Okay. <coughs> okay, so the HTML collection is just a, I guess, a collection of HTML. Um, wait. What can I do with it? Um... That's not very good in terms of what I can do with it. So I guess maybe we have to look at the sub-element HTML select. Uh, which is what we actually have here. There we go. Uh, these elements also share the blah blah blah, who cares? Autofocus, disabled, form, labels, length, multiple, name, opt read only. That's not looking too good. Um, Selected index, selected size, validation message. <sighs> oh, here we are. Yeah, that's what we're looking for. Add. It's so obvious sometimes. Um, Boogie. Let's see what this does. Probably gives me an error. Okay, no error. <gasps> it worked! That is freaking amazing. That's amazing enough that I'm going to save that. And I'll push it to, you know, with to get stuff. Okay. Alrighty. So now we can get a little bit clever with this. So whenever someone types something uh, into the text, we can maybe change the... Um, I wonder if we can change it to be like completely... I mean, like wipe it out and rebuild it each time. So let's try that now. Uh, okay, so when this happens, so I guess we need select like wipe out or something. Um, add blur check validity item uh, named item remove. Um, at the spe specified index of options, so I think we can remove everything all right so let's see if this should be doable in like a using the length uh, option um number of options okay and then we can just remove them willy-nilly uh i don't know what that means i know who chili willy is for let i equal now can i use something like um can I remove an option as an object, or do I have to remove it as a um, as an index? Specified index. So okay, that actually sort of makes sense. So I, I just need the specified index, and I can remove. So that i equals zero. I less than um, select length. No, 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 length. Hey, you're supposed to have a length element. Not cool. Standby. Is it a property or is it a is it a function? And why is it in red? Oh, fuck. <laughs> That's why. The number of option. 
Docking Fusion has not been written yet. Well, that's that's just fantastic. Um, okay. Um, so if this works, this should every time I touch something, every time I touch myself, yeah, something should happen. So boom. Um, that was unusual. So every time I'm typing something, it removes one element. That's not what I want, though. Um, it should remove everything, every time. One, two, three, four. F. So two of them are gone for some reason. I wonder now. Um, you know, I think the problem here is every time I remove one, the um, the indexes all change. So as ugly as this looks, I should either count backwards, which is probably the right way to do it, or I should just remove zero each time because each time the it, D1 becomes zero. So this, that didn't do it. That still didn't do it. Um, yeah. Do I need to go backwards here? Let's try that. I equals select length minus one. I greater than zero. I minus minus. So this way we're we're not kind of stomping our own elements as we do it, because that is kind of weird actually. Okay, so beautiful. I type one letter, and that was pretty good. I mean, I almost got rid of all of them. And I guess I might as well console log what we're removing. Okay. Three, two, okay. And of course I meant greater than or equal to zero. Because that's that's how I roll. So now, boom! Awesome. And then, well, let's just add like five freaking random numbers to F with it. Um, variable reuse. Let's say zero to. Okay, and then we could do. Let can I actually? Oh, this is so nasty. Can I actually just add, create the new option, and just add it at the same time? Select, add new option. Um, this is probably gonna choke because I don't know if it lets me add numbers. I think I could add strings only. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Baby needs a new pair of shoes. Um, this is awesome. Okay, so basically every time I do this, I get 20 new random numbers. Uh, hopefully it does clean up the, the option that I had created and gets rid of it because I'm not using it anymore. Garbage collection. Okay, so now we need something resembling a list of stars. Which I do have somewhere. Um, and then as I type in here, maybe we'll say if the length is greater than two, just show all the stars that match, you know, that, whatever I've typed in. Or maybe you have to get the first letter right or something. I don't. I don't know. We, but that that's that is sort of 
Okay, so now what we want to kind of say though is if you choose one of these options, uh, this value here will become that option. Um, so can we do the, that? Probably we can. Um, and we could probably just put a listener on the select itself. Um, so that's going to be our next little... This is not the standard kind of autocomplete where, you know, it, there's a nice pull-down menu, but it is kind of like uh, when you start typing, you'll get this, this select statement that... the select statement... <laughs> the select pull-down, and that'll be, you know, more and more accurate as you type. Once you choose something, bam, you got it. Presumably it'll match itself. Um, but that is, that is interesting. Um, this is definitely something to look at. But, okay, going for another two hours and we were on for about an hour earlier. Thank you for watching the stream and good night for tonight.